I was listening to a conversation about a film the other day in which uh, there's a sequence that takes place on a prison transport plane. And the director went and looked over what one of these planes actually looks like and was disappointed to find that it basically just resembled a commercial airplane. You know, not much different to what we fly on or when we used to fly. And so, you know, in order to make his, the sequence in the film more compelling and engaging and dramatic and intention filled, you know, he invented a bunch of stuff, you know, like electronic locks on the floor that hold feet in place and a, you know, a bunch of stuff like that. And obviously that's a long tradition in, in film and, and, and other kind of, you know, novels and the like, when you're even engaging with a real life figure or a real life situation or, or, or reality, someone grounded in something that exists is the need to be inventive and creative, to synthesize, to simplify, to, or to make more complex, you know, what's going on because a film is not a Wikipedia entry. It's its own thing. And so there's a, a you know, a freedom then to be creative with source material, with, uh, you know, reality in order to make something work and stir an audience. The issue is probably that a lot of folks doing theology, at least according to my guest today, and I think she's right, uh, do that often sometimes with the lived experience of those people whom they are engaging in order to synthesize, you know, diverse groups and experiences in order to, um, you know, draw something, draw a lived experience or a lived community into one's argument, even if it doesn't necessarily fit properly or is not necessarily being, you know, engaged in its depth of nuance and diversity. And we need to be better at that. And I hope I will be too. And so I'm very excited to welcome my guest today, Sarah Gillingham, who is an Anglican who speaks of her experience of being born with intersex traits. She is featured on national TV, radio, and newspapers in the UK, as well as contributing articles to the religious press. Sarah has recently worked with the Church of England's House of Bishops on including intersex in the Episcopal teaching document and materials entitled Living in Love and Faith, published in November 2020, and has shared her personal story in one of these resources. I'm excited to welcome Sarah today to Love, Rinse, Repeat. Love, Rinse, Repeat, for those who don't know, it's a podcast recorded on Dark Young Land by me, Liam Miller, he, him, his, a minister in the Uniting Church in Australia. I'm glad you've dropped on by and uh, welcome and stay around for the chat. See ya. Well, uh, Sarah Gillingham, welcome to Love, Rinse, Repeat. <laughs> and, okay, Thank so you. I, we're gonna, we'll, we'll acknowledge this now because we just had a whole conversation on whether I was going to try to say <laughs> Gillingham like in a more English mode or, or Gillingham, as I guess I would think about it. With the or Australian Sarah accent. or Sarah. Yeah, Sarah or Sarah. Yeah. So like, yeah, I was so <laughs> focused on Sarah that I, I, I went back to the, uh, the other one. So anyway, that's it. We're off to a rocking start, but that just brings everyone into the, we were so, we had the whole conversation. So we were so, I was so in my head about how I was going to do it. I'm not sure what to call myself now either. Yeah. Right. Well, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, exactly. We'll just, well, yeah. <laughs> well, Sarah, welcome to Love Rinse Repeat. It is great to have you. So we, we kind of connected because about a month ago, I posted an interview with Susanna Cornwall on, um, on her work on intersex theology and the Bible. And you engaged with it on Twitter and, and we kind of got to talking uh, about the interview and about, you know, the topic in general. And, and so I was like, oh, this would be great. We should, we should, as I had talked with Susanna, I was like, this is the start of um, conversations that I'd like to have on the podcast. And uh, so, so this was then a great next step. So I guess maybe, you know, the, the, the big opening question is, why did you get, you know, uh, why did that interview grab your attention? Why did you uh, enter into the conversation? And, and, and I guess, you know, what is it that, that you know, drew, drew this whole thing together? <laughs> One, I've worked with Susanna a little in the past, who's a fantastic theologian. And I'll come back to that, what I think mm. a good theologian is. Oh, that'd be great. Uh, she's been involved with the Church of England for quite a while now, whereas I got... Uh, involved in discussions around intersex with something they had something called shared conversations mm -hmm. where it's predominantly about human sexuality but I was invited along and most of the stuff that had been written in theological terms at that time was by Susanna yeah. and she's a great brain but what makes her such a great theologian is how she collaborates so a lot of my criticism really of 
uh, liberal theologians generally is they're not always good at collaborating. Mm. And the, the reality of that sometimes mean they get things wrong. And we sometimes undervalue lived experience. But the reason why it's important, I'll probably give a couple of examples. And this is why Susanna gets it right. And others who have written about intersex just simply get it wrong. And one of the major problems I've had when I've talked about my own lived experience is people conflate it with other things. So, you know, there's a big debate whether I belongs against LGBT. You know, is it LGBTI plus? And without going the in, ins and outs of that, uh, the problem we get in theological and church circles is it tends to get conflated with trans. Mm. So often I've spoken about my own experience and people still go away from the conversation thinking I'm trans. I go, I'm not trans. You know, I've tried to explain it. I thought I might, I've almost got so desperate, I've come along with a piece of plasticine and started modelling what <laughs> intersex people may look like. Although, mm. having said that, when we talk about intersex, it may be, we talk about variations, it may be variations in sex characteristics that are to do with genitals and gonads, but equally maybe to do with chromosomes, so it's not visible. People may have an extra chromosome, for instance. Mm. Or even differences in hormones so it's not actually as yeah. black and white as that either and the other thing you know in the discussions I've had with Susanna a lot of people who've generally spoken about sexuality have looked at intersex and assumed it's an identity mm -hmm. you know we talk about intersex Christians well yes it may be in taken on as an identity so I was involved in help with a couple of others arranging the first intersex contingent at London Pride a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. So yes, you know, you'd say, right, okay, most people in that group would take it on as identity. But the reality is most people with intersex traits or variations in sex characteristics don't. Mm -hmm. But a lot of theologians have assumed we do. Mm -hmm. And I've seen this in recently the church of england have just put out the series of materials called living in love mm. and faith and i don't know how big it is you know outside england and wales <laughs> but yeah i'm not, I'm not sure either, so, yeah yeah, yeah, might not learn. <laughs> yeah yeah so the uh, going back a bit there's a typical church of england being there, seeing themselves at the head of the Anglican Communion, I think the initial idea was it would be a blueprint for other denominations mm -hmm. across the world. But everybody else has done it now because the Church of England is <laughs> a little bit behind. So instead of being <laughs> the leader, we're suddenly the uh, dragging our feet. Sure, yeah. But, you know, put that to one side. Mm. Uh, but what... So when they put those materials together, they didn't include anybody who had insect trait. Mm. And they were taking papers where liberal theologians had written very brainy stuff, but assumed it is all an identity. Mm. And if, you know, the re I do research with Surrey University over here in the UK, a little bit with Exeter. And what we know is, if you take the population as a whole with variations, the majority don't, you mm. know, they don't see it as, you know, I could say, I am Sarah, or is it Sarah, or is it Gillingham or Gillingham, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite sure what I am anymore. <laughs> uh, it, I forget, I've lost my train of thought. Oh, that, like, you know, you could take it as an identity. Yeah. So, okay. So, but the research we did was finding that most, I would say, I am Sarah, the accountant, mm. with variations. 
mm. you know, it's description. As I could say, I'm Sarah, the accountant with blue eyes. Mm. It's really mm. description. It's my own identity. Now, the reality is because of, I'd probably flip them personally. I may flip them, flip out of that, you know, because I'll, I'll say, well, hey, it's not an identity. And then my partner will start chuckling away and going, you should all star, it's not an identity. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's that assumption. Mm, and the, mm. other, the other thing is, is that quite often theologians in the past when they've spoken about intersex haven't actually kept the focus on what it is to be intersex what the pastoral needs are what what the concerns are but really take our stories and then start talking about other things you know start mm. talking about gender identity something different because mm. But then they're not again necessarily interested in gender identity. They may be in, they're taking that and talking about, you know, the sex is being complementary and human mm. sexuality mm. and so forth. And this is very much what I saw in Living in Love and Faith project is that they were really taking intersex but losing that focus, misunderstanding it, and really talking about sexuality. And an interesting work I've been doing with Susanna and I want to give a plug out to another theologian mm. I'll, I'll just put a book here yeah Karen O'Donnell who's been writing a lot about uh, trauma theology mm -hmm. and the thing I've been sorry I've got things collapsing now <laughs> <laughs> I've got the, if you can see I have this pile of theology books <laughs> probably Always see behind me a great big bookcase but yeah. I'm, I'm surrounded by books I, I think I think it's probably a little bit of a problem with us, all those religious types yeah. um, <laughs> yes <laughs> but many books and we have about 10 different versions of the bible or yeah. <laughs> well I've got a few of those lying around yes um, good to have yeah but what we were doing with her is talking about epistemic violence and mm -hmm. this idea that people are not trusted to tell their own stories yeah because we're too close to it mm -hmm. and and we also start talking about how you know sometimes when i speak about it it's water off a duck's back basically but sometimes you are reliving traumatizing experiences mm. and there's difference here between suffering and trauma you know but there's a couple of times when i've certainly been involved in discussions and been a little bit surprised you know the effect it's had on me mm. so with karen o'donnell we're putting together another book next year and, and where the likes of Susanna and Karen are so good is that collaboration yeah. giving a platform really to people with a lived experience so you're not taking away their voices mm. whereas what we saw with Church of England and the living love and faith they're effectively taking away the voices of those with the lived experience mm. and and it you know we often coming from where I am and sort of discrimination I've faced and I continue to face in the church. It's easy to point the finger at more conservative elements. And, but actually sometimes the problem is amongst the liberal. Mm. And it's by taking, taking our voices and, you know, not giving us the platform mm. for ourselves. Yeah, a sense of trying to add to the add to the raft, add to the numbers, you know, and the community who are being represented in, in advocating for change and greater inclusion, but you know, essentially using the you know whatever whatever thing they want to take, like look at this biological thing to bring into the argument, rather than going, well, how are these people understanding it themselves? How is it yeah you know, impacting the way they are received by the world? Um, and, and what does it mean for exactly as you said earlier their pastoral what are their pastoral needs their unique pastoral needs um, okay, again, yeah and 
And one thing we talk a lot about is power, isn't it? And I think mm. from that, quite often we talk about where does the power lie when we're trying yeah. to read text. But taking a step back, when we conduct our work as theologians, where does the power lie? Yeah. So quite often, I, I was in a rather comical conversation where I was invited to Church House in Westminster next to Houses of Parliament in London. And I was sat in a room with a mixture of conservative and liberal theologians and church hierarchy. And they had a debate about, oh, we must really talk about power and privilege. And the amount of emails, a couple of um, newspaper articles I did in religious newspapers over here, to get in that room mm. and have a voice as an ordinary person, I thought that they're talking about it, they're writing about it, very mm. cleverly, but they don't recognise they're part of it. Mm. You know, and they're not, and there's almost a collusion sometimes. Mm. But we're all very good at keeping those on the margins. We're very good at speaking for those on the margins. We're quite often our different churches, denominations talk very well for those on the margin. Mm. But we're not a church of the people mm. who are on the margins. Where are they? You know, are they at the table? Are they on the different church committees? Yeah. Are they in the room? And often not. Yeah, totally. And 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 sometimes it's because, you know, it gets in the way of the um very eloquently past reflections on 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 what it means to be that identity, that marginalized <laughs> identity, you know. Uh yeah, you know, I, absolutely, I have to say I absolutely adore some of the uh some of the words we sometimes use in church. And right. <laughs> I, I was... And we kind of dress things up to make them sound holy. And, mm -hmm. and I remember talking, oh God, it'd be about three years ago, about safeguarding to one of the bishops, uh, particularly for people with intersex traits. And there was a feeling, oh, no, we need to you know, go through a period of prayer and discernment, you know, to before we think about what uh, safeguards we should put in place. <laughs> and I'm thinking, come on, mate, take, think about it for five minutes. You don't need, you don't need prayer and discernment to work yeah, out. Yeah. <laughs> and so we come on, and I think we're very good at using words that yeah. other people, if it's anything, I'm an accountant, I would probably use some technical terms just to block people out and make <laughs> And I think, I don't know, we feel like yeah. we're fantastic with words and fantastic, you know, like even, I think things like epistemic violence, which mm. we talk about that and I write about. Mm. Really fascinating. But to the person in the street, I'll probably get, if I start talking to the neighbour, Mm, mm -hmm. I might yeah. get just a little bit of a blank look. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I don't know why this one came to mind, but like using the like holy language to like when you're like just think about it for five minutes and it'll be obvious. But it's like it's like you know, people often talk about like in particular types of churches where like teenagers want to ask each other out and like having to like couch either the approach of like it's been really on my heart. I think Jesus wants us to date, or the rejection of uh, look, it's really on my heart. I've been praying and I think Jesus you know, wants me to date the much more attractive, cooler person over there. Um, you know, but like, you know, th these kind of ways that, yeah, you, you, we, we couch things where you're like, as you say, when you just go, look, I think we just need to treat people better, you know, or we just need to safeguard those who are, who are already being treated poorly. Um, you know, you think the, the r very easy response is, yeah, good call. How do we do it? <laughs> you know, like, yeah, you, yeah, you know, yeah, I'm kind of, kind of thinking about my own, how I met my last partner and how, how many years it took me about four years to ask them out. Because <laughs> <laughs> we were both in church, and I, you know, I was thinking, oh, you know, yeah. you know, there were certain rules that this isn't a dating club. This is. Yeah, yeah, you know, sure, sure. <laughs> so it was a bit slow getting going. Um, mm. But so there's other. 
Yeah, sorry, carry no, on. That's all right, that's all right. Well, one thing I was, I was, you know, this came up in our initial discussion on Twitter was, you know, and we've kind of been touching on it here, where is the proper, like, you know, location for the discussion about people with intersex traits? You know, as you say, it kind of naturally gets brought in to the discussions around gender and sexual diversity. But, you know, as you brought up on Twitter, there's, you know, an argument to be made that this fits better in the kind of, I guess, the field of, of, of disability theology um, and the like, or at least can, can fit there uh, as well. And so I guess I wanted to ask you a bit about that. And I guess, you know, whether you feel that if that was where it kind of more naturally went to, whether it wouldn't be as much of a fight in the church, um, it wouldn't be as much of a, you know, whether that would change the contest uh, that's a word, uh, the contest around it at all. Yeah, now that's a really interesting point. And I think this is something that Susanna brought up actually in the podcast before. And I'm going to give another mm. shout out for a book. Her right. book she yes. spoke about, which is Sex and Uncertainty. Mm. The Christ. And the reason why I'm showing this one is she talks a little bit about that disability. And it's funny over the years, just, you know, somebody with the lived experience, I, you know, I do identify with the LGBT community, but cognizant many with insect traits don't. Mm -hmm. But even take, taking that, I still get very much drawn to disability theology. Absolutely. And when I've been talking to bishops about it, that's generally the direction of travel when we start talking about yeah. it. And does it take heat out of it? Because then there's less panic, if you like, that, oh, gosh, what does insects mean for our understanding of gender mm. and sexuality? Yes, it does take heat out of it. it doesn't, but that doesn't make it right. Mm. You know, it mm. mean. But personally, I do identify a lot with disability theology. Uh, I was trying there's something actually she wrote in here I probably I think I'll read it read mm. it out I can't, yeah. can't remember the exact words there's a bit where she says healing a particular conditional state of being does not necessarily equal eradicating it mm. so why identify with that bit is quite often when I start talking about my experience, people have been panicked by my existence, you know. It's like, what do you think I'm going to do? Yeah. <laughs> Don't right. worry. I'm not, I'm not, this idea these people feel that just talking to me in some way they'll be tainted and they start suddenly praying that I'll be healed. And, and I often think, well, what exactly are you expecting there, you know? I'm somebody who's, if people know a lot about what happens to intersex infants and all these non-consensual surgeries we have well that's my story you know? so I've been through a lot so, that's, so there's a little bit of me thinking a bit comically thinking well you know I wonder if anything's happening here so you know it, I was thinking well as you're praying what are you expecting are you expecting parts of my body to start transform or mm, mm. Yeah. you know what do you yeah. mean by that? Mm. you know because <laughs> The issues we have is not, you know, there's many variations and there may be some medical issues associated with that, but for me personally, there isn't. Mm -hmm. So the problems I have are really with other people's attitudes and mm -hmm. responses mm -hmm. and this idea of secrecy and stigma. Yeah. Now, and this is where the disability theology really comes in, is that the biggest problem many people face is that idea of stigma and yeah you know there is the other stuff there accessibility issues depending on the disability or whether it's physical mental disability social so yeah sure there's differences and there are sort of physical aspects to this and but where there's no pain mm. you know what it is all about other people's attitudes yeah. And one story I say is that certainly with insects, we're still all a bit, particularly when you're English, you know, we're not very good at that talking about stuff at the best of times. It's a bit personal. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, 
yeah, of course, it can be a little bit embarrassing when people start probing with some particular questions. Mm. But it's really the secrecy and stigma, mm. you know. Which, which makes you then think that, like, really, truly, the, um, you know, with that kind of understanding, the prayer for healing really needs to be that the, the, basically the prayer is the one who needs to be transformed, right? Is the prayer needs to be healed of, of these attitudes. You know, the thing that should be magically changing is, is you know, what they're thinking in here and the structures and, and, and whatever out there. You know, that's the stuff that needs to, in those cases you say, transform. That's, that's the healing that... Yeah, there's required. another conversation I just I can I'm thinking about right now mm. is you know, it's really it came really from somebody with very conservative views and it you know you the yeah. all male or female whereas obviously I had had traits that were not typical of a female baby mm -hmm. so he thought I was you know, the result of the fall, and et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. stuff. Mm. And then we started talking about scripture. Now, for me, you know, I don't go to the Bible and look for the word intersex in there and see if I exist or not. I kind of, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like, I kind of, it's not there for that. You know, the Bible, to me, it mentions love over 300 times. It's about love and mm. all being made in the image of God, and we can go to the Psalms and stuff. So I thought, right, okay, he has this very narrow view that you've got to be mentioned somewhere for me to accept you. So we started talking about, uh, about Matthew, talking about how, in the book of Matthew, about how Jesus talked about people who, of eunuchs who were born mm. that way. We talk about in Acts, about the Ethiopian unit being baptized by Philip and whatever and I, I'm terrible I, I should be on commission because I'm going to shout out another book kind of <laughs> and I am I not on commission but I damn well should be I know. And, and for people from a more this is an American author mm. Mika Franza who really writes from a more even conservative evangel not conservative more evangelical perspective yeah and she talks a lot about those going through scripture mm. stuff. And what this bloke said at the end went, he kind of relaxed and then realized I wanted it was some sort of somebody who was possessed or as a result right. of all. Ah, oh, you're a eunuch. <laughs> and then I had visions <coughs> say, That's about you, but I was thinking about all these films that I've seen over the years, Hollywood films, with all these yeah. eunuchs going around serving women in a glass of goat milk, you know. Think, <laughs> I'm not sure if this is a blessing or not that he suddenly likes me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I can finally put you in a biblical category. Um, yeah. That, yeah. I love that logic of, yeah, unless it's actually written down, it, it cannot possibly, like in the, in this picture, like, you cannot, like what, what, it, what does he make of computers? I don't know. Um, yeah, that's. Or frogs even. I'm yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 kangaroos. Um, yeah. That's hey, a... I just, can I do one more thing? I, yes. I just, just entertain me. I have, I do, I was actually the other day, was going through and looking at all these different references to you notes, mm. and I put in my little bookmarks, Cookaburras. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I tell you, and, anyone who's and a couple of kangaroos. Oh, that's brilliant. That makes my heart <laughs> sing. Anyone who's just um, this is really one of those ones that if you're just listening to the podcast, you've you've missed out a lot of the lot of the fun of this, uh, a lot of the <laughs> thrills of this this episode. But they just, you've still got most. Uh, that's yeah, because it's so interesting then that that response, is, as you say, and and and, and yeah, the the kind of like able to kind of de-escalate it, quote unquote in his head but I guess as you say like you know when you were talking about you know also talking with the bishops and how it can kind of de-escalate going that road I guess there's also probably then as you say when you also feel a, a, a connection to an identification with um, the LGBT plus community you know maybe this pull of like you know I don't want to um, get my inclusion through this other way at the expense of showing the distance from from this, I'm sure that that must make it a, a complex um, 
yeah, in, you know, I, a complex I, piece as well. Not saying that you're doing that, but I wonder if that's like, you know, like that, that must be a, um, and just showing the complexity of the topic and of the, as you say, of the lived experience and why it's important to talk to people with a lived experience. Cause I'm sure like, yeah. you know, all these things like, you know, fine. you know, am I saint or am I sinner? How I go about <laughs> it. But I, uh, mm. you know, I'm very practical. And one, one of the general things I often say and talking about the whole subject is, you know, I wish we had a bit of a theology of common sense, actually. <laughs> and because we sometimes go down these rabbit holes having very wonderful arguments. And rather than taking a step back and having a good look at ourselves and going, well, is this person fundamentally a decent person or not? You know, without sticking them in a bucket and passing judgment on them. In terms of that you know, disability or talking about sexuality and gender and theology around that. The reality is, and again, the research that I did at Surrey University bears this out, where we were looking at around public perceptions of intersex mm -hmm. work with, with uh, Peter Hecate and David Griffiths, mm -hmm. was that we found that LGBT identified people we're a lot more open to listening to our stories. Mm. And, and that's the reality. So when it came to talking about intersex in the church, it was the LGBT groups that were giving me a platform to talk about it. Mm. Mm. Now that's the reality, that's the practicality, that's the reality. And personally, you know, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, it wasn't, the, the reality is, whoops, I'm getting a bit carried away, waving my arms around. <laughs> Actually, I was reaching for a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> um, <Very wish. laughs> they, there aren't many, it probably says something about us, isn't it? But there aren't the same platforms there for people talking about disability theology mm. which is something to think about actually mm. and you know we talk over here we and you know, i we have it in reaches out to australia as well as inclusive church where we're not just talking about gender sexuality yeah. we're talking about poverty we're talking about disability mm. we're talking about ethnicity and and we're talking about mental health. And I do think there are, there are certain groups that are left even further behind. Mm -hmm. And it says rather a lot about us and it's rather quite levelling actually. 100%, I appreciate you that, that being brought up. Because I think sometimes, yes, we, we, we tend to kind of be a, a bit of a one issue at a time thing and it's like and you know and, and we get all consumed with issues and 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 in particularly you know it's usually it's often in recent years been the the question of gender and sexuality or in some churches it's the question of just um women leadership you know not even getting to the beyond but like but like you know we see now you know in the midst of this discussion which is so important there is as well yes what is you know gl you know poverty on the rise, you know, and, 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 and huge gaps. There's, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement and, you know, we're here in Australia, the push, for, you know, against, you know, continued um, persecution, violence, injustice towards first peoples. You know, there's, there's all these issues the church needs to be wrestling with, all these voices who need to be brought to the table. And sometimes it feels like, yeah, the church goes, oh, we're just, this is the one we have to have now. Um, and, and sometimes forgetting that there's any level of like, this community also includes people from those other communities. Um, we can't have the other ones yet. Uh, and I yeah. think you're totally right that if we're going to say an inclusion thing, it's, it's how do we uh, yeah, actually, you know, it, it, it's a whole of thing transformation, not the, okay, we're now letting this group in um, yeah. and, and not going to change much until another group gets so vocal that, okay, now you too. And I think often, we're not even actually really letting the group in. So, I, mm. I, you know, I think about poverty. So my own parents came from very working class roots in the north of England and did well for themselves. You know? um, but, you know, I was a kid, I remember, 
you know, I can reflect back and mm. understand the issues down there. And over here, we have a lot of food banks, as you know, I've seen when I was in Australia, we have bands going around, soup kitchens yeah. and things. Yeah. So we're very good at providing for the poor, but are the poor really at the table? Would mm. be my question. And I think there's a common thread that goes through all of them. Mm. And whenever I've read anything, any sort of lived experience pieces or read the theology, to me, they're all saying the same thing, you know, just from a different lived experience. And it's all, it, a lot of it comes back to this power and privilege and sense of deferment. And the other thing we've had, as you know, we've seen the Catholic Church in Australia mm. when I was there, was the issue around clerical sex abuse. Yep. And it's brought up some really big issues around this culture of deferment and lack of uh, accountability, you know, the opaqueness. Mm. And so it's, it's these cultural issues that are, are causing all the problems to me mm, mm. that are still not being tackled. Yeah. And we can talk about people who are poor. We can talk about any minority group, but until you actually really come to terms with that. And I'm talking about those, not, I'm talking about everybody involved, whatever their standpoint the conservatives, middle of the road liberals who are sharing in that power and privilege mm. until they recognise they're actually part of the problem. I wonder if we can really, you know, truly talk mm. about including all the voices. Yeah. So I think that's the big issue because I honestly don't, from my own experience, they don't see it. It's not mm. that they don't want to see it. Well, there'll be some that don't want to see it and know full well they've got it and they're protecting it with, you know, yeah. their best, some of these people have got the best brains in the, in the world, I was going to say in the country, but, mm. but you know, I was surrounded by Pete Oxford and Cambridge educated theologians mm. who, who were talking about parent privilege. Mm. And in that, you know, I talk about the church house and they don't see it. Mm. And what do you do about it? That's the question. I don't know. I don't have the answer. Yeah. I mean, I think as you say, part of it is that like, unless you are wrestling with the actual lived experience, unless you're going and, and hearing and, and, and investing the time and building relationships and not just like, you know, we went and did a day trip and looked around or I, um, whatever, like had a brief encounter, you know, actually forming, you know, relationships, learning and, and being transformed and letting it actually transform, right? Not letting it be like a blip in it, but letting that actually be the thing that shapes the work that's then produced, the um, conclusions that are drawn, the, the, the proposals that are made, you know, you're right. It doesn't, it doesn't happen. It's, you know, it's yeah. And it is, it is the this, this story that, that plagues all these issues of, you know, we want to talk more about a topic than um, the actually changed by people. All right. I'll give you one where it could change. Right. I got, I got, inv got invited to talk to one of the senior bishops mm -hmm. uh, over a year ago, who I think are very upset, whole load of bishops as a result of a piece I wrote in the Church Times over here. So they're trying to quiet me down, I think. Very difficult. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I was invited to the Bishop's Palace, which is all very nice. But you could say, well, you know, actually, if you want a proper chat, do you invite them to the palace mm. or do you go down to your local coffee shop and have a chat? That, mm. That's it. Yeah. Another bishop, another very senior bishop I spoke to, we went down the local coffee shop who recognised that. So anyway, I, I turn up at the bishop's palace and I knock on the door. Lovely doors, 
great big oak things, fantastic. And I thought, yeah, okay, I know we should be down the local coffee shop, but you know what, this is a really lovely building. I will not mind having a look in there. Yeah. <laughs> so knock hard, no response. Knock hard again. Next minute, somebody right behind in the tradesman entrance, a little annex built, this Bishop Palace was, you know, 300 years old. This annex was built in the 70s and it was a bit shoddy. Somebody comes out of this annex and oh, can you come through this door, please? So <laughs> <laughs> I walk through this really bit rubbish 70s annex, going past on this sort of four mica floor <laughs> and then get walked into the Bishop's mm, Palace mm. and sit in the waiting room and, you know, looking at these... Uh, pictures from previous bishops the last couple mm. hundred years I thought you know what let us through the front door because mm. I'm sure if I was important important yeah. they wouldn't have dragged me through the bat would they <laughs> no there's little things like that that's really yeah, that, 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 yeah yeah a hundred percent as you say, like not only the like you have to come here where you know all the pomp and circumstance can potentially you know intimidate you into 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 falling back in line, but even that exactly like just like oh yeah, someone pokes their head out of rinky dink door and tells you to come by. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate yeah, I appreciate that a lot. And I, I'm going to go on a bit more because it's such a fantastic day. So they brought me this mm. tea and cake from this beautiful China service. So I was actually quite enjoying myself, to be fair, even though I was you know, saying probably it should be down the local coffee shop. And anyway, I had to wait for the bishop. And then the bishop comes in and, or, and the staff mm -hmm. call the bishop, your lordship, and so forth. And, and then asked, oh, what would your lordship, would your lordship like a cup of tea? I was thinking, I said, I think I'll be wanting something stronger than that in the cafe. <laughs> <laughs> so all this pretense, this British English pretense uh. blew away, which was lovely. <laughs> and I, I, I put that down to, this is what I love about Australia. You know? <laughs> I, I, think, I think it was that 15 years in Australia. Yeah. And coming coming back to England to talk to some of the bishops affecting <laughs> my uh, interpersonal skills. <laughs> oh, I'm glad. I'm glad we could do such a thing. Like, that's a great cultural I was um, education. I was, I was <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. That's so great. But and and but again, it goes down to that like common sense thing, or the you know we don't need to sacralize this. We we're talking about something very. We're talking about human dignity and the, and the basic, you know, requirements of being treated with human dignity. Let's just talk about that and let's just get to that. Because um, I think, you know, a lot of, as, as, you know, with a lot of these kind of conversations, people trying to get that seat at the table. Some, you know, there's a sense in which what we need is huge cultural systemic overhaul if this is actually going to be, you know, a place for all of us. Um, but then all, almost some, in some ways at the same time, what we're often asking, what's often been asked for is pretty sm small beans, you know, like it's, it's, you know, or, or as in it's at least just like, it could be done like that, right? Like it, it could be, you know, we want this part of the liturgy changed. We want this um, written into polity or we want this just treatment, um, you know, in the same way that you are already very comfortable treating this other group, you know, like the people who look and, 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 and reflect who you are, you know, that's that like in some ways that, that, you know, I often feel that must be the very like head against the wall thing of like, is it so much to ask for the, you know, these, these crumbs from the master's table kind of thing. Yeah, mm. absolutely. So it depends on your denomination, doesn't it? In your, your own tradition. So, you know, the Church of England is very hierarchical, that's its history, and I think in some ways that's kind of what you buy up to when you're part of the Church of England, you know, it's led effectively by the bishops mm. and governed by the synod. And 
but there's still even within that model of church mm. better way of explaining it there's so much more they could do mm. Mm. by inviting us simply to the table yeah and mm. ultimately isn't that a, that's all it's about isn't it yeah right right yeah yeah a hundred percent a hundred percent yeah uh so i guess you know we're coming close to, to finishing up it's been a great conversation it's flown by um i guess you, you kind of mentioned a bit of the beginning but i mentioned like you know things you're working on now or you're you know any work you've got going on through the c of e or, or, or elsewhere that people might want you might want to draw people's attention to or what they can look out for uh do you want to you know, plug anything away at this point yeah so the main the, there's two things really so one next year is going to be this book that's coming out around trauma theology, yep. which, you know, Karen O'Donnell is pulling together. The other thing is the living in love and faith mm. uh, in the C of E. So actually, for people born with intersex traits, it has been a pivotal moment, as critical as I can be of the whole process and critical... I could be putting on an LGBT hat. Actually, for people with intersex traits, it has been a major moment because it's the first time the Church of England has actually spoken about this. Right. Recognise this. Yeah. And I, I have, I was invited to do a video, mm -hmm. uh, video resource. So within their, t it's a teaching thing basically that they're going through for a year. Mm -hmm. Before they put together proposals for change, if there will be any proposals, obviously. But I did a video for that, which is about four or five minutes long, where I tell a little bit of my own story. Now, the only problem with it, you do actually actually have to register, if you like, when you go on the link. If you put in the search engine "Living in Love and Faith Church of England," it kind of takes you to the resources. Great. And it is a major milestone. Mm, mm. Now, there's a lot I can say that's missing in the written resources. I could say, because they haven't had anybody with insect traits actually on yeah. their groups. They're missing a lot. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, it's a major turning yeah. point. Mm. And I see it as a start. So I'm very pleased. Mm. I'm disqualified <laughs> in many ways, but I'm also very pleased. And, yeah. and my hope, my prayer, if you like, is that all those people with variations and their families feel a little bit more able to talk to their vicar about it if they feel the need. And, you know, I've had general, you know, it depends where you are again, as per usual, you know, I've had vicars come up to me and says, oh, I've, you know, I've baptised three children with variations, you know, in recent years. Whereas I've heard from one parent that went, well, actually getting my baby baptised was really difficult and the vicar wanted to go to the bishop, which is... I I just can't believe it. It's unfathomable. But so that's where yeah. we're at. In yeah. some ways, it, for that reason, it's been probably a good few months. Yeah. Oh, I'm, as you say, that's that is like such a, a a gentle and generous hope of of exactly here is just like it is the thing of like you know that can be gained from you know in some ways that that kind of very structured thing of look it's been talked about here which means, you know, I have something then to bring to my more local, you know, representative of the church. And, 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 and yeah, you do just hope that it does open up some conversations. And, and as you say, it's, it's the start, but, but you know, the yeah, God is and, the start. Yeah. And really my call out is to all theologians out there, just think about how they do. Yeah. Theology and make sure it's important. Oh, I don't want to scare people off. <laughs> And say, don't do this, we're all being angry. <laughs> in, you know, the work I've done with Susanna is absolutely fantastic. Mm. At the end of the day, 
she's independent minded quite rightly that's her job as an academic and as a theologian it's not about me rewriting mm. people's work mm. but it's having that conversation and that involvement and so at least you're heard mm. but i don't i don't feel the need that we have to just dis- uh, agree with everything mm. but yeah uh, important because otherwise we're just gonna we need people to be engaged with these areas yeah yeah and have your own thoughts mm. and make your own mistakes in fact yeah you know, yeah, yeah. You know, i've made, made plenty <laughs> <laughs> <It's ours>. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah as you say it, and like but at least if you're making those mistakes then and you've been in dialogue then it's much easier to then you know, have that dialogue resume and, and, and you do either cop to that or at least make a case. You know, so I think you're right. Like, yeah, that, that's such an important message that's coming out of this conversation of, of you know, actually talking to people with lived experience and, and, and letting that shape the work. Yeah, you end up, you're the one doing the work is going to be marked by, by you, but, but it should hopefully be shaped and, and changed. And well, let's just say it better <laughs> because that, that, that process happened. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, Sarah, thank you very much for joining us on Love, Rinse, Repeat. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, and, and hopefully we'll chat again sometime. Thank you. It's been, been wonderful. <laughs>